if it, it contains anything else, it is ontic. Or is, pure logical. Is, is, right. is the, when we're using the term pure multiple, we should be thinking about a very Kantian sense of pure mathematics as a say in math. Um, the actual operator conditions of mathematics as such. No. We should not, not, not think not of it. Then, okay. We should not think of it in a Kantian way. We no, should no. think of not it in a set. Not setting. the word pure. The use of the word pure is what I'm going after. Oh. Right, when we say pure, how is pure mathematics possible? We just say like the operator conditions of mathematics. Like uh, pure multiple, the very conditions of having a multiple versus the set of people in the term has a multiple. No. The reason why that's not the case is because Badiou, especially in the early chapters, remember he, there's an entire chapter called, uh, up, I think it's called On the Conditions for Any Ontology, On the Preconditions for Any Ontology. Well, he gives us two operator conditions. Right, but here's the thing. In the sense that you mean, that would be the pure conditions for mathematics, mm -hmm. but also that's not for Badiou ontological. That's a meta-ontological statement, i.e. a philosophical statement. Mm -hmm. Ontology appears only in itself from the axioms and the constructs that can arise from those axioms. So what we should not understand, th this is an important distinction. Ontology is not in and of itself philosophical. So the notion of a pure Kantian uh, possibility or condition for mathematics is a meta-ontological statement. I don't, one, it's a meta-ontological statement, and two, I don't believe Badu would agree with it. Okay. Um, so no, you shouldn't think, you should, this is, this is perhaps one of the most anti-Kantian texts possible, um, and makes our radical rupture with just about, just about every single thing Kant asserts. At least I, everything that's asserted in the name of Kant. Yeah, okay. I think, because he has this, he, he offers a, a really interesting rereading of Kant in Logics of Worlds, where he says Kant is all but Bandelian. Um, Not unlike all, every other philosopher. Right, I mean, he does say that about everyone. In, in once, but, but what Kant is missing is specifically a question of mathematics. So, Would you say then that it's sort of meta autological uh, would, would it be correct to say that it's meta-ontological because it goes through philosophy to understand mathematics. Um, you could say that, but I think you have a conceptually uh, a conceptual difficulty, and the reason why is because that's a tautological statement. Anytime you say meta-ontological, the very thing you mean is philosophical. So I could equally say, is it meta-ontological because it goes through meta-ontology, or I could say, is it philosophical because it goes through philosophy. Or I could say, is it meta-ontological because it goes through philosophy? The terms are yeah. interchangeable. And this is, when we did uh, Manifesto, right, this is a point in saying there are these different truth procedures function as conditions for philosophy. Mm -hmm. Which means, uh, if philosophy is going to say anything about ontology, it's going to do it in a meta-ontological way. Right. And anything that's doing meta-ontology is doing philosophy. Right, because the way that I understand it right is the philosophy is a sort of gathering compossibilities of things, and one of the compossibilities of things is ontology, i.e. mathematics. Mm -hmm. So is that just why it would be improper? Like, in fact, even in the book, right, where he says, Kant asks the wrong question, because he's why, how is pure mathematics possible given the world of experience we live in? It's actually the other way around, right? And this is why we conceive of it incorrectly when we conceive of it the way that Kant does, because he does this in exactly that order. Well, is, what he what he specifically saying is I went back and read it. Kant asked the question, how is pure mathematics possible, right? What Kant wants to do with that question is get space and time back into the picture, mm -hmm. right? It's through fusion. You know, what he, what Buddy follows up with saying is, okay, yeah, it's a transcendental subject that makes that possible. But the question we should be asking is, how is a subject possible? I, That's what Buddy's question is. I, in this case, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, Joe, feel free to step in. I don't think it's the case that it's a transcendental subject that makes ontology possible. No, 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 no. Kant, Kant possible. That makes Kant possible? Yeah, I mean, I'll, how is pure mathematics possible in responding thanks to a transcendental subject? Rather, pure mathematics being the science of being, how is a subject possible? Yeah. Right. That's the question. That you yeah, no, yes. but, but here's an important thing that I think you're conceptually, it sounds to me as yeah. though you're conceptually misunderstanding is that what Badu is advocating for is that mathematics is conditioned on the possibility of a transcendental subject. No, that's what Kant's saying. That's what Kant's saying. Right, yeah. but then you're like, and then Badu turns it around. See, if right. you say, and Badu turns it around, there's still a transcendental subject somewhere in there. No, okay. no, 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 because his point is to say, given mathematics, is it possible for there to be a subject? That's what Badu is saying. Right. But I don't think that's what Chris is saying. 
Okay. Is that what you're saying? Um, what I'm assuming is that Kant has math, pure mathematics on the account of a transcendental subject, but he was breaking with that and wants to know how a subject is possible in the first place. Okay. Given but that pure mathematics is the study of the subject. Okay. But pure. Uh, I understand. Okay, so, I understand that there's not a one in modern ontology. Okay. Well, two two things need to be said here then. Pure ontology does not. It's not sutured. It does not depend on the subject mm -hmm. as such. Right. And the second is that a subject is not transcendental, mm -hmm. and is it is not a Kantian subject. Right. Okay. So if you understand those two concepts and what you're saying, then uh, it has a full understanding of those two concepts. Then okay. But it sounded as though right. it's you know that you were looking for the transcendental subject, which would no. then re-verify mathematics. There's not one. Okay. One. Um, could you elaborate a little bit about what Badu is talking about when he's talking about the notion of the idea and how it evolves from Plato? Um, okay, so what you have to understand is there's a, a long history of the idea, a history of ideas, as it were, um, going back to Plato. Um, so what you should roughly understand is the Platonic notion of the idea, then, this is going to sound odd, you also need to understand the Husserlian notion of the idea, and only then can you really begin to grapple with the Heideggerian conception of idea. So the Platonic idea, right, is collection and division, right? We get a bunch of stuff, we collect it together, we see that there is this underlying unity that brings it all together, you know, this form, and then we posit this as, right, a thing in itself, right, as the idea of whatever. Idea of chair, idea of... The example of best use is in the sophist. I mean, they use it to find what, what a sophist is, but they give a first uh, breakdown of it as to find an enabler, a fisher, right? So it's, you take, uh, there are two types of things. There are those that acquire and those that produce things, and then it, it subdivides it there and there and there. And then you get that an angler is a person who hunts, who does X, Y, and Z, and does a striking motion for, to gather fishes. So you, you, you basically... Um, Start with the concept, divide it into, and divide it, and divide it, and divide it, until so you get what would be specifically an angler fisherman, and then that's where, and you follow back up the chain. An angler fisherman is such that 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 that. So it's the idea of creating concepts out of this sort of presented world that exists in nature. Um, that's a probably a little bit to a certain extent a more Marxian understanding of, of how concepts work. Um, because for, the, for Plato, it depends on who you're reading and what reading you have of Plato. Gen, the general conception is that Plato asserts that these ideas exist in them of themselves and the way in which we discover them, right? And I, I mean that with that, that emphasis, discover, is, is because they already exist in, in, in a certain sense right. in themselves. It's a reflection. Right, but not necessarily in this, right, this is a sort of Marxian notion of, of the abstract, which is you have a concrete world and then you abstract I, concepts away to understand them. Plato is, most reads of Plato are, there's an idea, it gives form to the material world or the materiality is then mixed with the form. By examining this materiality, it brings you back to, right, the pure being, Right, ideos, um, which is that that form. Any any interjections? No, I think that's fair. Okay. I think it's worth pointing out that when Badiou talks about uh, the idea, the, the idea here, he's talking about specifically Heidegger's notion. Right. So Heidegger's written in Plato. If you don't mind, do, do you think a, 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 a detour through Husserl would be appropriate? Um, I don't know that it's entirely necessary. Um, it's helpful, I think, but it's not necessarily crucial. Okay. Just to follow what he's doing here. Okay, well, which of you guys would like help? I haven't done work in history also. What page you got? Um, 20, 124 is where he... Okay, there we go. I mean, he's uh, talking about the, the platonic term. With, I, I mean, Husserl is helpful, but I, I don't know the... It's not, he's not doing Husserl here. Yeah. The reason why Husserl, just, just for the record for, and for those at home, the reason why Husserl is helpful is because Heidegger is reacting strongly to Husserl. Yeah. Not because... Husserl is, is going on here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah Husserl, Husserl is Heidegger's professor, right? Yeah. Yeah. Heidegger studies of the Husserl and uh, inherits and rejects and then finally decides he doesn't understand Husserl's <laughs> project. Um, so that is, that's awful. Awesome. <laughs> um, and and uh, of course, the Nazis. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I mean, we can just, we can just go with the, the Heideggerian notion then. 
Um, which is, or you know, we can actually just just read this. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward in the text, starting with what. I was going with but in turn, or, or I guess the Platonic term. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's right before the Galilean reference to Plato. Okay. So. Well, and of course, anytime you have Galileo and the mathematization of nature, right? I always go to this world. Right, and that which is where Heidegger is getting this. But. Right. But nevertheless. Uh, the Galilean reference to Plato, whose vector, let's note, is none other than the mathematician, is not accidental. That's what it says is in mathematicism. Sorry. Oh, mathematicism. Yeah. is not accidental, sorry. Uh, the platonic term consists at the ambivalent frontiers of Greek destiny of being, of proposing an in, uh, interpretation of phusis as idea. But, in turn, the idea in the platonic sense can also be understood on the basis of the Greek conception of nature, or phusis. It is neither a denial or a decline. It completes the Greek thought.